Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to a new season, apparently. Hold out there. Um, hope everybody enjoyed Halloween. Um, I was, well, anyway, doesn't matter. I was tempted to dress up today, but Halloween's kind of over. Right? I should have done it on Wednesday. Uh, next semester, maybe. Um, well, no, next year. It's my next chance. All right, so today we're going to keep talking about recursion. So we introduced this as an idea last time, as a concept. Um, and that's what it is. It's not just a programming strategy, but today we're not only gonna look at a recursive approach to solving a problem, a simple problem, uh, figuring out how many nodes are in a binary tree. We'll go through that schematically, we'll review what we did last time, and then we're actually gonna write our first piece of recursive code. Um, which is fun. And this is essentially the kind of thing that we're gonna do for the next week or so, uh, a little bit longer than that. The homework problems today start with tree recursion, and we're gonna continue that pattern uh, for a while. You guys are gonna get uh, maybe a little tired of writing uh, tree recursive algorithms, but uh, this is great practice. And recursion is one of those things that, you know, you really have to see it over and over and over again, particularly if it's new to you. Even if some of you that think that understand it may need to see it again. And again, and again, um, in different ways before it kind of starts to click what's actually happening. Okay. Um, I also have some good news for you, which is that the class did really well on the midterm. So congratulations on that. Um, better than last semester, better than last year, actually. So I was happy to see that. Um, we have a new MP checkpoint that we'll release on, uh, over the weekend. That's gonna be the last part of the game. So this is it, this is when everything comes together. Uh, I know that many of you have the opportunity to drop this part of the MP. Um, I hope that you won't. I hope that you'll do this uh, so that you can complete the process so that you can actually get to the point where you have a fully functional uh, snake game that you can actually play and use. Um, once you guys finish that up, so just to think about how the kind of rest of the semester works, we have three full weeks until Thanksgiving. Um, so this MP checkpoint's gonna consume two of them. Once you're done with the machine project, then we're gonna get you started on your final project. Uh, and so in the lab, the week before Thanksgiving, uh, we'll start discussions of that, we'll have you identify a partner. The goal of doing this is to um, give you some time for those of you who wanna do a really cool final project to get some work done on that over Thanksgiving. Um, okay, and you know, so this is what's happening over the next, you know, month and a half that we have left in class. We have that week of Thanksgiving, there's four more quizzes, one more midterm. Um, the midterm comes right after um, Thanksgiving break. Um, and then we will have the final project fair. I need to set the date for that, I will do that soon. Um, but, you know, this is what's happening. Okay, so, let's go back and just review our tree terminology. So last time we started talking about this commonly used data structure in computer science called a tree. Um, a tree consists of a series of nodes that we organize together, that we structure in a particular way, such, such that every node has one parent, except for one node. So I have a root node. The root node of the tree has, is the only node that doesn't have a parent. Every other node in the tree is linked to a parent node. Now, the node itself doesn't always store a reference to its parent, but that's one way to think about it is that the node has a parent. Parents in the most general tree that we can talk about can have um, zero or more children, and the trees that we'll work with in this class, primarily, they're gonna have two children. It's a special case of a tree known as a binary tree. So, just to, again, review quickly some terminology, so we refer, when we're talking about, you know, we, we can essentially look at every part of the tree individually, and we can say a node is a parent if it has children. So this node has three children. Um, the children are descendants of the parent. Uh, each child, if you think about reversing that arrow, has a reference to one parent node, uh, because these are not roots, um, okay? Children have one parent. Every node in a, bin in a tree has one parent except for the root. So we refer to the top of the tree in the way that we'll look at it, of course you could invert these diagrams and they would work as well, but we refer to the node in the tree with no parents as the root node. Um, many of the algorithms that we are going to use are gonna start at the root. In fact, I shouldn't say many, all of them. 
our binary tree class that we're gonna look at today and be working with over the next week or so, the only information it stores about the tree is a reference to the root node. So this is sort of similar to what we saw with linked lists, where my list data structure only stored a reference to the start item. And then every other item was linked together um, as part of the list. Here, the tree stores reference to the root, and all the other nodes I can find by starting at the root. I start at the root, and then I find the root node's children, and I find its children's children, and stuff like this, so. So, the rest of the nodes in the tree are labeled as nodes here. Um, the, the nodes at the very bottom that have no children, we refer to those as leaf nodes. So any tree, any non-empty tree has a root, any non-empty tree has at least one leaf node. A tree with one node, the root is also a leaf. Um, in a tree with more than one node, I have at least one leaf node, right? If I didn't, the tree would be infinite in size. All right, so we can talk about the depth of the tree. The depth is the, um, the depth is determined by, we can talk about, sorry, the depth of a node in the tree. So the depth of a particular node is determined by how many hops it takes to get from the root node to that node, from the root to the node that we're thinking about. So these two nodes in my tree here are children of the root. They have uh, depth one. It takes me one hop to get from the root down to both of those nodes. The nodes down in this part of the tree have higher depths because it takes longer to reach them. So here, if I started at the root, I get here with one hop. This node is at level one. I get here, the second hop, this node is at level two, and I get to this leaf node here in three hops. So it's at level three. The height of the tree is the maximum number of steps it takes to reach any leaf node. And you guys will actually write the algorithm to compute this in a couple of homework problems. So given a tree, figure out the height. So essentially what I need to do is find all the leaf nodes and then figure out which leaf node took me the longest steps to reach. Okay, so now let's start looking at a recursive algorithm on a tree. And again, we presented this last time, we didn't implement it yet, we will today, uh, after we get through talking about it. Um, but, you know, this is a good starting point. It's a good starting point because as you'll see, the recursive solution to this algorithm is extremely elegant. It's um, simple, it's only a couple lines long. Um, but conceptually, it could be a little tricky to figure out how this works. So let's walk through how we're gonna do this. So when we approach a problem recursively, what we're doing here is we're designing a recursive algorithm. We're not writing recursive code yet. We're talking about a problem-solving strategy that counts the number of nodes in this tree recursively. And here's our general approach for designing recursive algorithms. At any step in the algorithm, we need to either do one of a couple of things. One thing that we can do is we can make the problem smaller. If the problem is too big for us to solve, then we can say, well, you know what? I can make the problem smaller, and if I could solve these smaller problems, then I could come up with a solution to the, to the full problem. So that's one thing we can do. Um, once there's a certain point that we will reach, that the algorithm will get to where I can't make the problem any smaller. I've made the problem as small as possible. Uh, sometimes that means that we reach a leaf node, or we reach a, yeah, we reach a leaf node. Um, sometimes it means we reach an empty tree. We'll come back and we'll see uh, that in action in a minute. At some point, the problem is so small that I shouldn't need to make it smaller to solve. At that point, the solution is evident. And then the other thing I'll need to do is figure out a way to combine the results. So if I have two smaller problems, how do I combine them together into a solution to a bigger problem? If I can do these things, so any algorithm that can take a problem and make it smaller, and then can solve a problem once it gets small enough, and can combine the solutions from smaller problems together to solve a bigger problem, can eventually solve the bigger problem, right? I'm gonna break down the problem, you know, in this uh, rigorous, sort of well-designed way, and eventually it'll get so small that it's easy to solve. And then I can combine those solutions to the simple problems together to make a solution to the slightly less simple problem, slightly bigger problem, slightly more complicated problem. And once I do that, I can eventually solve the problem that I started with. All right, so here's how we're gonna do this with counting. 
okay? So here's the big problem that we're trying to solve. We're trying to, to count all the nodes in this tree. And keep in mind, I don't even know where these nodes are. All I do is have, all I have is a reference to the, all my tree has is a reference to the node with value five. It has a reference to the root, okay? So how are we gonna break this problem into smaller subproblems? Well, I mean, here's a proposal. Given a tree, the size of that tree, given any node in the tree, the size of the tree that's rooted to that node is one, I need to count that node, plus the number of nodes that are in the left subtree of that node, which could be zero, plus the number of nodes that are in, sorry, the right subtree. Left subtree, one, left subtree, right subtree. Okay, so what have I done? Here I've actually both proposed a way to make the problem smaller, because my left subtree and my right subtree are gonna have fewer nodes in them than the entire tree. So my left subtree is gonna have fewer nodes. So that's a smaller problem. My right subtree is gonna have fewer nodes. That's a smaller problem. Notice that I've already, I'm also proposing a way to combine the results together. Here I combine them by adding them. I add the nodes in my right subtree, sorry, left subtree, to the nodes in my right subtree, and I make sure that I count myself, the node that's the current root, okay? So here, here's the node that's the current root, that's one. We know how many nodes are in, the, in, in that part of the tree, just one. I have no idea how many nodes are in five's left subtree. And I have no idea how many nodes are in five's right subtree. But I knew if I knew how many nodes were in the left subtree and the right subtree, then I could tell you how many nodes were in the entire tree. Okay? You may think I'm belaboring this, but this is the essential step. Now we're just gonna repeat this, okay? So I've got two smaller problems. Now I have to count the number of nodes in a tree that's smaller than the original tree, two of them. One tree here, rooted at node three. One tree here, rooted at node 10. So if I can count the nodes in the tree rooted at node 10 and the nodes in the tree rooted at node three, I'm good. I can solve the puzzle. All right, well how do I do that? Well let's, let's just, let's just continue on. Okay, so now let's examine one of these smaller subproblems. How do I count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at node three? Okay, well, let me try applying the same strategy. So I don't know how to count the total number of nodes in the tree, but I know that if I could count the number of nodes in three's left subtree, and the number of nodes in three's right subtree, and add one, I would have the answer. Now here, the problem's actually getting even easier, because node three doesn't have a right subtree, okay? So now, you know, now things are getting better. Now, let me start again. I'm, I'm just restarting the algorithm. This is why it's called a recursive algorithm. It keeps restarting itself, pretending now that seven is the root of a tree. Well, if seven is the root of a tree, how many nodes are in that tree? Not a trick question. If I give you a node and it doesn't have a right subtree and a left subtree, then the number of nodes is one. Yeah, so now, this is the smallest possible subproblem, and I've solved it. Once I get to a node that has no children, I'm done. You know, now it's like, wait, okay, well you told me to count the number of nodes in the left subtree and the right subtree, there is no right subtree, there is no left subtree, zero, zero, one, I know the answer, right? The answer is one. Okay, so good, so now let's go down the other side. I'm doing the same thing. I'm just reapplying the same algorithm. If I'd wanna count a tree, and the tree has, if the root node has children, then I count the right subtree and the left subtree, and I add one. And here I go, so I'm doing the same thing. Now again, I've reached a leaf node. So I've reached a problem that I can solve immediately. This is the smallest, possible subproblem. That's what I have to solve. At that point, I can't keep making the problem smaller. There's no smaller problem here to solve. I've identified the smallest possible problem. I'm gonna do this here too. 
Okay, so now, here's the second stage. So sometimes when we write a, when we, we, we write a recursive algorithm, we think about two stages, particularly with trees, sort of a natural way to think about it. We think about it kind of working its way down to find smaller subproblems, because as I go down the tree, right, so the first thing I did was I separated the tree into a left half and a right half. Each one of those was smaller than the original tree. So as I go down, I'm identifying smaller and smaller and smaller problems to solve. Then what I do is I combine the results kind of as I go back up. And that's where I start to solve more complicated problems. So I take these simple solutions, I merge them together, and I get a solution to the more complicated problem, okay? So here, we're here on the left side, I'm gonna take the solution to how many nodes are in the tree rooted at node seven, and combine it with the solution to how many trees are, how many nodes are in the tree that doesn't exist, which is zero. And now, I do the same thing over here. So I know how many nodes are in the tree rooted at node nine, and I know how many nodes are in the tree rooted in node one. Now here's the, so three, so when we got to node three, we essentially told ourselves, if I could count the number of nodes in the right subtree and the left subtree, I would know how many nodes are in this subtree. So if I could count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at seven, I would know how many nodes are in the tree rooted at three. And indeed, I do. Because seven got back to me and said, hey, the number of nodes in the tree rooted at me is one. And so three goes, okay, now I know how many nodes are in the tree rooted at three, it's two. Same thing over here for node 10. Node 10 had said, hey, if you could count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at node nine, my left subtree, and the number of nodes in the tree rooted at node one, my right subtree, then I would know how many nodes are in the tree rooted at me, node 10, and I do, it's three. Number of nodes in the right subtree, plus the number of nodes in the left subtree, plus one. And now, so again, now I'm, I'm solving more complicated problems. I started off trying to count the number of nodes in a tree that we knew had six nodes. And then I broke it into a problem of counting the number of nodes in a tree with two nodes, and the number of nodes in a tree with three nodes, and now I'm ready to finish the job. So now my solutions have gone all the way up. Five, when we started this, we said, hey, if I can count the number of nodes in five's left subtree that's rooted at node two, three, and I can count the number of nodes in five's right subtree, which is rooted in node 10, then I know how many nodes are in the entire tree. So three got back to me and it said, hey, there's two nodes below me in the tree that's rooted at me. 10 said, there's three nodes in the tree that's rooted at me. And now five can uh, finish the job. Five's the root node and it can come back and it can say, there are six nodes in this tree. Whew, okay, questions about that. I know it hurts my brain to explain, so I'm sure that it hurts your brain to, to look at. Okay, so we can go back and forth between the algorithm and the code, but let's implement this. Okay, you guys are gonna be surprised, I hope, at how easy this is. So uh, let's look through this code together for a couple of minutes because this is, um, this is a uh, tree structure that we're gonna use a lot for the next week, okay? So I've got, and again, this is sort of good object review. I have a class called binary tree. I have this new static field that's of type random, and I'm gonna explain what that does in a minute, okay? Then I have an inner class called node. This is sort of like my list. Remember, my list had an inner class called item. This is a node in the tree. This is a binary tree. Every node has zero, one, or two children, and we refer to them as left and right. So my node data structure, it stores a value. Remember, I do want to store data in this tree. Uh, and we'll use that data later when we do some uh, algorithms on trees. For now, we're just counting the number of nodes, so the data is sort of irrelevant. Um, but I have a way to store a, a reference to an object so I can store any kind of data I want in this tree. And then I have a right child, which is a reference to another node, a left reference to another node, and I have this uh, constructor that I created um, that just sets the value here. Um, okay. So now down on line 13, there's, there's a lot of code here, so we're gonna go through it together. Uh, we're not gonna add much, but, uh, but there's a certain amount that's needed just to kind of set up a tree. And there's actually already 
a recursive algorithm in here. I'm gonna show it to you. All right, so the one thing that my tree needs to know is what is the, it needs a reference to the root node. That's the top of the tree. All the other references are stored within the tree. So once I find the root, I can find its right child and its left child, and I can find their right and left children, and I can ex essentially explore the entire tree. All right, um, so I've got my root node, and then down here, here's what I want to look at together for a minute here. I don't wanna explain this in a great amount of detail, but I just want you guys not to be uh, freaked out by it. This is, this is as simple as I could make this, believe it or not. Okay, so the question is, for the purposes of running these uh, examples, we need a way to build a tree. So how do we build a tree? Well, what I wanna be able to do is I essentially wanna be able to add nodes to my tree. I want you to give me a list of objects, and I want a way to add them all to the tree. And in order to make our examples sort of interesting, I also wanna be able to add them, I wanna carry a random tree. So the trees that are created by this algorithm contain all the values that are in the array that's passed into the constructor, but those, um, those object values might be anywhere in the tree. Um, there's only a couple of rules about where things go that we'll look at in a minute. Okay, so when I, add an, when I add an object to the tree, I call this function called add. So if you look here at the constructor, it takes a list of object references, and it adds them one by one to the tree. So it keeps, keeps calling add, 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 and it calls add on the root node and adds a new value to the tree. So here's how my add function works. It takes a, two arguments. The first is a reference to a, the current node. That's the current place where we're gonna try to add that node. The second is the value to add. That's, sorry, that's the current place where we're gonna try to add that value to the tree. However, it's possible that that node, let's say I, so let's imagine that I run this algorithm and I run it on the root node. So the first time, the root is null. And so I can add a node right away. The first node I add to the tree becomes the root node. Then I add another node. And so that could become the root's left child. Then I add a third node that could become the root's right child. The problem is at that point, what do I do? Because I'm out of no, I'm out of spot, right? I can only reach the root node. And so what I've done here is I've actually um, provided a recursive add algorithm. So what this does, and it's a little bit uh, trickier than this. So, so let's look at what happens inside the add function. So first of all, if, um, if the root node is null, so the first time this co gets called, there's no root node. If the root node is null, then I set, I create a root node by creating a new node with the value that was passed and setting the root reference to that node. So at this point, the tree has one node in it. Otherwise, here's what I do. So this goes back to this random reference that we had above. Random is part of the Java standard library, and it's a uh, collection of methods that give me random values. One of the things I can ask random for, you can ask random for a random int, for a random double, but one of the things I can get from it is a random Boolean. So this gives me a random yes or no value, a random true or false. So half the time, random next boolean is gonna return true, and I'm gonna enter the top part of this if statement. The other half of the time, it's gonna return false, and I'm gonna enter the bottom half of the if statement. In the top half of the if statement, here's what I do. If the current node doesn't have a right child, so if current.right is equal to null, I add the value to the current node as its right child. I do the same thing down here. So if random not next boolean is false and the current node doesn't have a left child, then I add the node as the current node's left child. Otherwise, now here's where things get interesting. I call add to restart my algorithm on either the right subtree of the current node or the left subtree. So essentially, the algorithm works as follows. It says, I'm gonna try to add the node if, if half the time I'm gonna try to add it to the right, half the time I'm gonna try to add it to the left. If the node doesn't have a right child, and that's what I've decided to do, I'll add it as the right child. Otherwise, I'll add it to the right subtree of that node. If the node doesn't have a left child, and that's what I've decided to do, I'll add it to the left side of that node as its left child. Otherwise, 
I'll restart the algorithm on the left subtree. So this is a recursive algorithm. Right, essentially, it's making the problem of adding a value smaller every time by adding it to a smaller subtree where there's more likely to be space. Okay, that's, this is a more sophisticated recursive algorithm than I would expect you to understand right now, but I just wanted to talk through that quickly. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna write this, and I also provided a recursive two-string function. You guys can look at that yourself. All right, so this, this code should work. Um, it creates trees properly. I can add, I'm creating a tree with integers in it. Um, I can add as many integers as I want to this tree. The toString function prints out all the values in, a, in the tree. But let's figure out how to count the number of values in the tree. So I want to implement this size function, okay? So a lot of times, if you look, look at the toString function, so I have a public toString function that takes no arguments that calls a private toString function with a different signature. And this is something that we're gonna see a lot when we work on trees. When we write a recursive algorithm, we're gonna, st we're gonna start the recursive algorithm on the root node, right? So let's, let's uh, use that same structure to do t uh, size. Let me put that up here. So I'm gonna create a private method called size, and that private method takes a re it takes a reference to the node to count the, so essentially this is the root of the subtree that I wanna count the number of nodes in, okay? And when I call size, I'm essentially gonna return size started at the root. All right, so this is now gonna still do the same thing because I haven't implemented my recursive algorithm. Yet. Okay, so let's do this. Now, what's the, so when we, when we went back here, right, what was the simplest subproblem that we were able to identify? At what point do I have to solve the problem? There's a certain tree that I should be able to count immediately. How do I know that I've reached that point? Yeah. Yeah, so say if, current dot left is equal to null and current dot right is equal to null. What do I do? Turn zero? What about me? I'm at a node. Remember, uh, this always gets run on a node. So, you're close. If I'm counting, an, if I'm counting a tree that only has an, one node and has no children, then the size of that tree is one. So here, let's return one. Okay. So this in a recursive algorithm is sometimes known as the base case. This is the point where we cannot continue to make the problem smaller. There's no smaller problems here. I found a node that has no children. I have to be able to count that tree. There's no way to make, there's no smaller problems. There's no right subtree, there's no left subtree. Okay. Otherwise, so let's say, Let's do this. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna create this value, and let me call it count instead of size. Size is the name of my function. So I'm initializing count to one to make sure I count me, okay? Now, what are the two smaller problems that I wanna solve? Okay, so again, I can't count all the nodes in the tree from here, but I know what are the two smaller problems that I want to solve? So I'm at some node. I know that this node has either a right subtree or a left subtree, maybe both, right? What's one of the smaller subproblems that I want to solve? This, okay, so the size of the left subtree, right? So let's say count plus equals size of current dot left, okay? This is where, for some of you, your brain is gonna start to explode a little bit. I'm in a function, and I'm calling the same function. It's weird. But there's no reason that this doesn't work, right? Now just, just sort of like 
put your worries aside for a minute about whether or not this is actually okay. Um, I'm just, the, the function that I called, size, is supposed to count the number of nodes, let me put a little comment above it. Count the number of nodes in the tree rooted at current. So I can call it on my left subchild. Now I need to, this, this code isn't quite right yet. Can someone help me here? If I run this, this is probably going to cause a problem sometimes. Yeah, I might not have a left subtree. So let's just fix this here. Let's say if current.left is not equal to null, then I'm gonna count my left subtree. All right, what else do I need to do? Yeah, I can't ignore my right subtree, right? So now I'm gonna do essentially the same thing. I'm gonna say, if I have a right subtree, then the number of nodes in the tree rooted at me has to be increased by how many nodes are in my right subtree. So this is essentially one plus the number of nodes in my left subtree plus, oh wait, sorry, no, that's right, count plus equals. So one plus the number of nodes in my left subtree plus the number of nodes in my right subtree. Okay? I'm gonna change this down here to return count. And let's see how we, how we went. Oh man. Check style. what you guys signed up for. There we go. Yeah, seven. Is this right? Let's look at the, let's look at the uh, example I did here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That looks right. Let's take off a few nodes here. Five, that looks right, okay. Our first recursive algorithm. This recursive algorithm has a bug. Who can tell me what it is? I can provide an input that will cause it to crash. Who can tell me what that is? Yeah. Current is null, but how do I get current to be null? Normally I'm not gonna start the algorithm if current is null, but there's one special case here. Yeah, way in the back. What's that? Okay, so if the length is zero, but how would I get a length to be zero? Yeah. Oh, if I only, okay, so let's try that. So if I only have a root, that would be one node. That works, but you're close. We're heading in the right direction here. What about this guy? Boom! So what happened here? My root is null. So when I ran the algorithm here, let me go up here, sorry, let me move some things around here so that this is closer to the ex example code that we're messing with. I'll just put the two string stuff up here, better, okay. So here's the problem. In this example root, was never set to anything, it was null. And so I called size root, and then I started using root as if current, as if it was a valid reference. So let's say if I do this, I'm gonna put another, so this will handle that case, okay, good. All right. Okay, so this is correct, and this, is the thing that most closely matches what we talked about when we went through the diagram. Does anyone have any questions about this? I do wanna go slowly here because this stuff's tough. Totally, totally get that. Again, like, I mean, I still remember. I don't remember much from 20 years ago, literally 20 years ago this semester when I took intro programming for the first time, but I do remember recursion and struggling with recursion and being confused by it. So it is not unusual to feel queasy, weirded out a little bit um, by this type of approach. Okay, so let me, let's do something together here. And this is gonna be characteristic of our other tree algorithms. It's gonna make this a lot nicer, okay? Because I promised you this was going to be simple, but what we have up there, it works, it's correct, but it's kind of, Kind of not, not as nice as we would like. Okay, here's what I'm gonna propose. 
What we're doing right now is we're stopping our recursive algorithm when it gets to the leaps, right? So if I look at my code, when I get to a leaf node, this is known as my base case. If the current node has no left or right child, it's a leaf node, and I return one. But here's what I'm gonna propose. Let's let our algorithm not only get to the leaf nodes, but get to an empty reference. So let's imagine that we allow the algorithm to walk off the leaf nodes and to walk essentially into an empty tree. So everywhere where I have a reference here that is to an empty tree. So three has a reference to an empty tree as its right child. Seven has two references to empty trees. Nine has two references to empty trees. One has two references to empty trees. So what's the size of an empty tree? If I go to a tree, if I go to a node that's null, what's the size of a tree rooted at node null? Zero, right? If I, so imagine if I ask how many nodes are in seven's left subtree? The answer is zero, right? How many nodes are in seven's right subtree? The answer is zero. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna keep this little part in here from lines 56 to 59. What this means is that we've walked off the end of the tree. We got here because we followed a left reference or the root or a right reference that led us to a tree that didn't have any nodes in it at all. So those trees are empty. They have size zero. If we do that, let me show you why we're gonna do that. If we do that, then we can do the following, okay? We can say that the size of the tree is one plus size of current dot left plus size of current dot right. Is this gonna work? Let's try it. Let's put some nodes in here and see how we go. Looks like it worked. Okay, so now this looks nice. Okay, so why is this working? Let's just linger here for a minute and think about it. So before, that code that I deleted, a lot of it had to do with avoiding null, right? What happens if current dot left is null? Because, I c because the problem is I couldn't call size on a null reference, it wasn't safe. But now the point is that my base case is if I get a null reference. If you give me a reference to a null tree, I know the answer. I know how many nodes that are at zero. So now I can write my, I can write this algorithm, recursive algorithm, a much, much more pleasing way, right? This makes me much happier as a computer scientist. It says, how many nodes are in this tree? One plus the number of nodes in my left subtree plus the number of nodes in my right subtree. That's exactly what we had worked out together when we went through the diagram. The only difference is, if my left reference is null, my left subtree has zero nodes in it. If my right reference is null, then my right subtree has zero nodes in it. But my size algorithm, is, my size is gonna handle that. Because if I walk into an empty tree, it's just gonna say there's no nodes here. All right, questions about this. Because this is typically what we're going to do when we write our recursive algorithms. The reason is, they're so much nicer, right? So look at what we, let me just go back up here. You know, look at what we started with, right? We started with this, okay? So I have deleted 10 lines of code. Now I've gotta recreate this and replace them with one line of code. And, you know, again, I am not, I don't, I don't want to be here to sort of uh, encourage you to, to, to idolize code that's short. That's actually not good. Um, I, was, I was actually reading um, the creator of Python, um, whose first name is Guido and whose last name I'm not gonna try to pronounce, but um, he apparently went to work at Dropbox for a while. Dropbox is a company maybe you've heard of. Uh, apparently Dropbox uses Python a lot internally. Um, don't know why, uh, but so Guido decided to go there and work because they did a lot of Python work and he is the person who created the Python language. But apparently one of the things that he did, that he spent a lot of the time encouraging their, their engineers to do was to stop writing such clever code. He would find code that was overly clever and he would say, you should make this more clear. You know, it probably gets longer, right? 
but stop being so cute with how you design things, right? Um, you know, a shorter algorithm is not always better. A longer algorithm in lines of code that's more easy to understand is frequently superior. However, in this case, this line really distills exactly what this algorithm does. It counts the number of, no it counts me, the number of nodes in my left subtree, and the number of nodes in my right subtree. So I, I think this is a much clearer formulation. So this is what we're gonna do in the future. We're gonna handle null as our base case, figure out what to do there, and then we'll allow ourselves to essentially walk off the tree, right? Because we know that we can do that safely. Any questions about this before we go on? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the question is, why can I call size inside size? Uh, the answer is, you can. Um, you will figure out why you can later, and I don't wanna go into it, it's complicated, but essentially, when I call size, inside size, it behaves like any other function. So when I start on the root, um, you know what, let's, let's do this. Uh, it's, it's hard to do with this one. We'll come back and do this later. So the idea is, when I call size on the root node, let, let, let me, um, let me make this example a little smaller. Yeah. One, two, five. When I call size on the root, here's what happens. So my size function starts running. It's running on the root node. The root node here is value one. Then it gets to this line, and it says, oh, I need to run the size function. And it calls size on current.left. My first copy of size is now waiting for the second copy to finish. So the second copy of size starts running. It says, am I called on null? No. Therefore, I have some more to do. So it gets down here, and it calls size again. So now I've got three copies of size running. Now both, and I'm about to have four, because I'm gonna call size.left and size.right. Both of those functions are gonna return right away because they're gonna get to a null reference. And then the second copy of size is gonna finish. My first copy of size is now gonna call size again on the right, and the same thing is gonna happen. So there's really no difference I mean, if you want to think about what's happening internally, fine. But there's really no difference between calling a function inside a function and calling the same function inside a function. It's something you can do. I could call toString, I could call whatever, right? I can call a function inside another function, and the function that gets called does its work, and the function that called that function waits for it to complete and then proceeds. So there's really no difference here. The fact that I'm calling the same function is just sort of a anomaly that's due to how I structured this problem. Yeah. Why do I have two size methods? Right, so the idea here is that um, I don't want, uh, it's a great question. So see here, my root node's private. My tree class is not gonna expose its structure to the people that use it. It's gonna say, you know what? You don't need to know how I implement a tree. I am a tree, I've got leads, I've got nodes, it's all good. Um, if you want to use me, I'll tell you how to do it. So if you want to know how many nodes are inside this tree, you call size. See here, I'm calling size with no argument, right? So anyone outside of this class doesn't, can't access the root node, right? Internally, what I do is I say, okay, if I want to know the number of nodes in the tree, I call the size function that starts at the root. Yeah. Great question. So that's why I have an overload here. We're going to do this every time. Right, when we do other recursive functions. All right, let me give you guys some advice about recursion, because again, this is a tricky concept. It's something that can be hard when you get started. It takes practice. You're gonna get practice. You're gonna be okay. Um, so, first thing here, whenever you write a recursive algorithm is you eventually have to stop. This process of making the problem smaller has to reach an end. It can't continue indefinitely. If you can't try to continue it indefinitely, um, your program is never going to, to, to end, okay? So this is sometimes known as a base case. That's the point where you are solving the puzzle. So here, our base case is when current is null. That's the point where I don't call size again. I'm done. 
I've walked off the side of the tree and there's no nodes there to count, okay? Make the problem smaller in each step. If your each step of your algorithm, simmer down, isn't making the problem smaller, then again, you're never going to stop. You have to make the problem smaller and smaller and smaller to eventually get to the point where you have a problem that's small enough that you can solve. This is known as the recursive step. So again, back here, I'm calling size on my left subtree. That has fewer nodes in it than the whole tree. That's a smaller problem. I'm calling size on my right subtree. That has fewer nodes in it than the entire tree. That's a smaller problem, okay? And finally, figuring out how to combine the results together. So again, I've got one line here. That one line is doing two things. First of all, it's solving two smaller problems, the number of nodes in the left subtree and the number of nodes in the right subtree, and then it's combining the results together. It says the number of nodes in the tree rooted at me is the number of nodes in my left subtree plus the number of nodes in my right subtree plus one to count me. All right. So here's, so here's another example of a recursive algorithm. I don't want you guys to think that these are all confined to trees. So this is an implementation of factorial, right? Factorial of a number is the number multiplied by uh, the number one smaller than it until you get to one, right? So just like we talked about, this has these, um, these features. So here's my base case. The factorial of one is one. That's the problem I know how to solve. Otherwise, what I do is I say, I know that the factorial of a number is that number times the factorial of the number that's one smaller. So here I've got my recursive, here's my recursive step. I'm calling factorial n minus one, and here's combining the results together, right? So the base case is when n equals one. The recursive step is calling factorial of n minus one. That's what makes the problem smaller, because I'm going towards one, I hope. And combining the results together is multiplying the current value times the factorial of the number that's one smaller, all right? Here's the problem, though. I have to reach the base case. Remember, I have to stop at some point. So I'll give you guys, you know, last little problem before we break up today. How can the code above fail? So this code can fail to reach the base case. Yeah. Yeah, or how about zero or negative number? Yeah. So what's gonna happen here? I'm gonna say, okay, I need to compute the factorial of negative four. Well, how do I do that? I do that by computing, uh, multiplying negative four times the factorial of negative five, right? Okay, how do I compute the factorial of negative five? Well, I compute the factorial of negative five by multiplying negative five times negative six, right? How do I compute the factorial of negative six? Well, I compute the factorial of negative six by combining negative, multiplying negative six by neg the factorial of negative seven, right? This is not going well, right? I am not going to get to one. So if you try to run this code in the playground, um, you're gonna get a runtime error. And this essentially men means that you, you never got to one. You kept calling factorial over and over and over again, trying to solve the problem, but you weren't making the problem small. You weren't getting towards the base case. Okay, this is where we will pick up on Monday. I don't really have much of anything to announce today. Um, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Stay warm, adjust to the new climate. Um, good luck finishing up MP3. Uh, the third checkpoint, and I will see you guys on Monday.